Hey fellow gliders, welcome back. This is Robert Petito, and in this video, we're taking a look at Glide's call API action in tandem with the query JSON column. These are two new previews that Glide released over the past week or so, and they are going to supercharge your app in a variety of ways. I've already created a couple of videos on ways that you can leverage the call API action, but in this video, we're gonna take a step back and just look at it in its simplest form. How to craft a URL, what that data is that we receive, how to inspect it, how to parse it out, how to even transpose it, and different things that we can do along with this data to supercharge your app. To get started, you're gonna head over to your team folder, go to the preview section at the top, and make sure that the call API action and the JSON columns are both turned on. This will allow you to have these two new features in your Glide app. I'm gonna go ahead and open up a brand new app. It has not been populated yet. And in our use case today, we're gonna to do a simple search. We're gonna call an API for anything related to a particular book that we're interested in. We're gonna see what data comes back and how we can manipulate that data to build out some functionality in our app. So the first thing you have to know is that if you want data in your app, you're gonna to have to populate your data table at some point. So you can either pre-populate a table full of data, right? I can create a new table here, call this data, and just populate this data full of information that I would want my users to access. Or we can call upon an API that already has all of that data stored someplace else. So Google, for example, has their own Google Books library database. And we don't have to copy that database and paste it into our app, so, so to speak. We can actually just call upon that existing database through an API, this application programming interface. Now, some of the terminology I'll be using in this video is that we'll be calling up an API with our request. That API server will be doing something with our request and then generate a response. And typically that response is organized or formatted into JSON. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's just a simple way that's kind of easily readable by a human, but also easily parsable by a machine in order to organize the data that's coming back from this API server. So for our app, we are not gonna pre-populate it. We're gonna get the data on the fly, which also makes our app more lightweight. So when it comes time to building out the search interface, you have to figure out where am I gonna build this search experience? Where should it live? If you were to really boil it down, there'd be two main locations that could serve as a possibility to where we're actually gonna do this API call. You can either place it in the users table, you can create some columns here that will allow you to do the search and so forth, and it's already gonna be user specific because we are in the users table. However, if your user's table is already kind of cluttered full of user information, maybe you want to keep the search separate. You can do that. You could, or maybe your app is not one where users are even signing into the app. You want to give it like a public experience. So in that case, you could also create a new table here. And this table can just be search. Or this dedicated table is going to be a one row table. We call this a working table or a helper table. And its job is not to store data, but its job is just to provide a function. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to use this working table as the source for our UI. Now this search table is going to be shared amongst all users, so we have to make sure that our columns are user specific. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new column here called search. I'm gonna make sure it's user specific, and it will be a type text because this is going to be a book search. Okay, done. We don't need this name column, I'm gonna trash that. So we have our search column, now we also need that response. So I'm gonna create another column here, let's call it response. It'll also be a text column, it'll also be user specific. Okay, so we're gonna have a search for if I'm searching for a book, right, I'll have the users be able to type something in on the front end. Um, easy search about a cat in the hat. Right, and then ultimately we want a response full of data about cat in the hat, about whatever our book search is. Now, we need one way to make this happen. We have to take our search, we need to craft a call to the API, and then the response that we're gonna get from the API will land in this response column. Now, an API requires that you call up the server, and a server is nothing more than just a glorified URL that's gonna be protected by some sort of authorization. 
Now, there are also free APIs that don't require authorization. Um, our book search is actually going to be one of those APIs. But often when you're calling up an API, it will require authorization tokens that will let you into the server on a user by user basis. Now, in order to determine what URL we need to call for our API, we have to do just a little bit of investigation, a little bit of research. So I've already found the Google Books APIs website. And if I were to scroll down here a bit, um, we end up finding that the URL to call here is this get request. And there are a variety of requests. A get means we're going to receive a bunch of information. We have a post request, which means that we're going to create something new through the API. There's a put request, which means we're going to edit something. Um, and then there's also a delete request, which means we're trying to remove something. So in this case, we're trying to get information. So we have a get request, and this is the URL. And it does not require any authorization token. So I don't need to create an account. I don't need to create an API key. This is just the API that we get to call. And we can take a look at this URL. We see that there's the protocol of HTTPS. We have our host, googleapis.com. We have our path of books and then volumes. And then this question mark means that everything after the question mark are parameters that we can call upon to figure out exactly where we should be in the API. And so the Q here stands for query. And then it says Q equals, so query equals, and then whatever our search term is, All right? So if we were to do, if I were to actually take this URL, copy it, open a new tab and paste, you see we're going to get a bunch of information related to quilting, <laughs> right? It's just a bunch of data. And this data here is structured in JSON. This is a JSON object, OK? So we want this data to hit our app. So we're going to go ahead and copy this URL and then go back to our Glide app. And we're going to recreate it using a construct URL column. That's one thing you're going to find as you're dealing with this call API action is that you have to craft your endpoint using the construct URL column prior to actually calling the API using the call API action. So I'm going to create a new column here, and we're going to call this endpoint. And if I be something specific, you can like search endpoint or something. The type here is going to be a construct URL column. And we're going to paste in the URL into this host field. OK, we're going to get rid of the protocol. And the path is this books v1 volumes. I'm going to cut that and paste it down here. And then Q stands for query. And then again, the Q here is going to be one of our query parameters. So instead of putting it as part of the URL, we're going to make it a dynamic parameter that's being set from whatever our search term is. So our Q will go down here. And then we want whatever our search term is. We're going to set that dynamically here through the triple dots and then choosing our search field. OK, which that means we can get rid of that value in our URL. All right, and you can take a look up here in our endpoint as it was crafting it. We see that this looks very similar to what we saw on the other page, except instead of quilting, we have cat in the hat. And you see that this is URL encoded. That's why you see the percent signs and things up there. All right, and done. OK, so we have our endpoint. And we're going to go ahead and call the API so that way we can generate a response. Now, there's two ways to do that. Either you can create a call API column that's continuously searching for this endpoint and will continually give you results, uh, but that can easily eat into your update quota. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to build out an interface where it's going to call the API through an action instead. That way we know it's just a one-time action. Um, we won't have to worry about any sort of API caching involved. And then we're going to get our response instantly inside of our response field. OK, let's go ahead and build out that interface. So if I go back to my app here, all right, we're going to set this book search tab to be our search tab that we created here. OK, we're going to get rid of this collection. So let's create a very minimalistic search experience. I want to go ahead and add in a text entry element here. And this will allow us to search for the book. And as we change the book title here, you'll see that our endpoint automatically changes. So instead of cat in the hat, if I were to search for Don Quixote, you see that as I'm typing, it's automatically filling in the endpoint 
at the bottom here, right? So this data will always be available for me to the moment I wanna call the API, it's there and waiting. All right, and then we need a button to call the API. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in a new component. This will be a button component. And the action on this button will be to call the API. So we can say search, we can give it a nice friendly little icon of a search magnifying glass here. And our action is going to be the API action, this generic API call API. All right, there's a few different things we have to fill out here. Our endpoint is gonna be that dynamic endpoint that's being generated here, that construct URL column. The method is a get, if you remember, we're trying to receive information in. And there are no headers, so there's no authorization keys, but if there were, we'd have to add one here in our, in our header. All right, and the results are gonna end up in this response field here. So I'm going to select the response field. And that's it. That's all we have to do to set up this particular API call. So now watch what happens when I hit search. In a matter of seconds, we have a response in our response field. And again, this data is formatted and organized into JSON. It's a JSON object here. Okay. If you're not familiar with JSON, I highly recommend taking a look at codebeautify.org. I'm going to go ahead and copy this JSON, open a new tab, go to JSON Beautify, codebeautify.org. And on the left-hand side, if I were to paste in my JSON here, we can see how it's organized on the right-hand side. So we have this JSON object with inside of this object. It gives us a little bit of information about what this object is, that it's um, looking at volumes of books, and that there were actually 1,550 items that it found, but it's grabbing the first 10 of them. That's why we see this items array designated by these square brackets here. And if I were to dive into each item, we see that there is a book ID, we see that there is some volume information, and inside of this volume information, we have the title, we have the author, we have all this great data that we didn't have to pre-populate in our app. All right, and all of this data is available to us in this JSON format that's already living in our app now. So now all we have to do is that we're tasked with parsing out this JSON in a logical way so that we can read what it is with inside of our app and then maybe do something with it. So what I'm thinking here is that we're gonna take a look at maybe the first five entries, okay? And then allow us to select an entry and then maybe save it to our own book library. And we don't need all of this data. We only need some of the data, right? We want maybe the title, maybe the author, um, maybe the category, right? How many pages it is possibly. And they also give us the image. So maybe we want the image of the book as well. So I'm gonna hold on to this tab here. I might come back and reference it because again, it's, this is much easier to read than trying to sift through this um, <laughs> almost 800 line JSON object over here. Okay, so back in our Glide app, we now have this data in our response, but what can we do with it? We can't just display this raw data, right? I can't go, oh yeah, this is great data. Let's go ahead and uh, display this for our users because they're just gonna see this and that's hideous, right? We wanna display it prettily with inside of Glide. Now, ultimately what would be nice is if we could have rows, right? Or maybe some tiles or something, like one of these collection styles. But the problem is that these collection styles require that each entry, each book in this, our use case is on its own line. So we actually have to do a little bit of manipulation of the data here to get our different books, right? All of these different um, item arrays each of these 10 here that we see, onto their own line, each of these items. So there's a way we can do that in Glide at the moment. Um, we've branded it the miracle method. I have a video on that. I'll post it in the description below. And what that does is it allows you to take a value that's in a cell and expand it or parse it out onto their own rows. So in our Glide app, we're gonna create a new table here for each of those line items. So I'm gonna create a new table and we're gonna call this search results. And we wanted to have, let's say the first five books. So I'm gonna create five lines. Okay, now that we have our lines, we have to bring in that data into each of these lines and then eventually we'll be able to parse that out. 
So to bring in a singular value, in this case our response, into a new table, you can use a single value column. So I'm gonna call this results. The type is gonna be a single value column. And we're gonna get the first, which is the only value from within inside of our search results, sorry, within inside of our search response, like this. And so all that does is now our search results here has been copied to each row in this table. All right, so now what we need to do is grab the first item in the first row, the second item in the second row, the third item in the third row, and so forth until you get to the fifth item in the fifth row. Now, when we're dealing with JSON arrays, the first item inside of an array of items has the position of zero, not one. So we need to create an index that we can reference so that we can say like the zeroth or the first item in the array. So inside of this name column here, I'm gonna rename this to index. I'm gonna change it to a number column and set some of the precision and things on here. And I'm gonna type out the numbers one or zero through four. Zero being the first item in the array. Two, three, and four. Now if you had a 100 item array, you don't wanna to have to write all of those numbers out. There is a trick that you can do, let me show you what that is. So the trick is that you can create a row ID column, which is gonna automatically generate a random ID. From here, you're gonna grab a list of all of the row IDs using a lookup column. I usually call this all row IDs. This is a lookup column, and the lookup column creates an array from a table like this. So I'm looking up the search results row ID, so I'm looking up basically the same value within the same table here. And now we have all of the row IDs as an array, and then there's this nifty column in Glide called the search index, or find index. If I search for index, we see it's this find element index within inside of this array column. Um, folder. And if I were to select this, it's telling me what are the values to search. In this case, it's my row IDs. And it's finding the row ID of the current table. And it's going to generate that index for me dynamically. See that? So there's my zero through four here as well. All right. So if you have small amount of numbers, this is kind of overkill, right? If you, if you only want like the first five results, but if you have, again, a table of a thousand results, then yeah, you'll want to create this, um, this item index so that way you don't it can just populate dynamically let's go ahead and leave this in here i'm going to delete my number column just so you can see how you'd leverage this now we are tasked with trying to figure out how we can grab the first item inside of our items array here based upon this index so luckily in glide we have the ability to query some json so I'm gonna add a new column here. I'm gonna call this query results. And this is gonna be a JSON query or a query JSON column, All right? And the JSON that I'm going to query is the results. And my query is going to be some sort of custom query here, right? If I were to search for just the zeroth item in the array, Right, I can say uh, items, I think it's items zero. Yeah, like this. So you see this is items zero, right? Because in our object, items is the very first item with inside of this object, and it's an array, so I designate by square brackets. And you see here the ID of the first item is this BFI5DWAA and so forth, right? And if I were to want the second item, then I can do two, sorry, one, and then two, and then three. And you can see that our IDs are changing as we are specifying what value or what position, what item within that array we're requesting, right? But we don't want to have to type out a number. We want to... Um, set this number dynamically. So unfortunately we can't set like some sort of dynamic tag with inside of this query field. That means we have to take this 
this item here and craft it outside of this query field and then specify that here. So I'm gonna hit done for now. And we're gonna go ahead and recreate that query using a template column. So that way we can grab this number dynamically. So I'm gonna add a new column here. Let's call this query. It's gonna be a template column. I'm gonna paste in what our query was. In this case, it was items, square brackets, and then put some sort of character with inside of here. I usually use numbers. And I'm gonna replace the number one with the index. And now you see that our query has been created dynamically here. And then this is the column that I'm gonna use inside of our query field, like that. And so now you can see each of these IDs are different. All right, so now we have each book's data on its own line, but we still are tasked with parsing out the specific information that we need from within inside of this JSON set of data here, right? We don't need all of this, we just need some of it. And it looks like most of the information we're looking for here is within inside of this volume info key. So we have volume info, then we have our title, then we have our authors, right? We have our image, we have page count, we have all the fun things in here. The publisher, Right? And we can grab these things one at a time by querying this JSON even further. All right, so we're gonna duplicate our query JSON column, and we're gonna specify just the things that we're looking for here. In this case, let's start with title. All right, the JSON here is not gonna be our results anymore, but rather our query results, which is book specific now. And our query, now this can be something custom. So if you remember back to our JSON object, everything was listed underneath volume info. And it's gotta be spelled exactly with capitalization and everything. And you see now, look, we have some data here from within inside of that volume info nested object. And then the next parameter we're looking for here is this title, see that? And so if I were to do a dot title, now we have the title of the book. That's cool. I'm gonna hit done on that. Okay, what's next? We have authors, and inside of authors is an array, because um, there could be more than one author to the book. I'm just gonna grab the first item in the authors section here. So I'm gonna duplicate title, and we'll call this author. And instead of title, this is gonna be authors, plural, right? You see this, it's resulting in an array of values here. Uh, but we're just gonna get the very first item, which is square bracket zero just like we did over here with the item, square bracket zero. All right, this is our first author. Cool. Let's get the page count. Again, it's, that's going to be in volume info, page count. I'm going to copy this page count key. Let's duplicate the author. And we'll go ahead and paste that in like this, page count. Done. Let's duplicate this, and let's get the publisher which I believe is probably just publisher. Yep, like that. And you can see that this one didn't actually have a publisher for some reason. Uh, we can get the category if we want, but let's skip that. Let's just do the image links next. Okay, so that we have here, uh, if you search through here, we have image links, and then we have a small thumbnail. Uh, we also have a thumbnail and so forth. So let's duplicate this column one last time. We'll call this image, and this is going to be image links dot thumbnail, like that. And this should be an image. All right, so now we have all of this parsed out information within our search results table. Cool, so now instead of displaying that ugly JSON down here, now what we can do is we can display a collection because each of those items are on their own row now. And it's up to you how you want to display it. Maybe you want to display it with a image, right? With maybe a card displayed, something like this. And the source here is going to be our search results like this. Okay, so it automatically found the image, which is cool. The title, it found his title. And the description, let's do the author like that. Look at that. And for the meta, we could do the publisher or the page count or something like that if we wanted to. Um, maybe we do a horizontal scroll. They can scroll through the books like this, right? 
And then ultimately what we want here is the ability to add this to our library. Um, now we don't want them to be able to edit or add from this uh, button up here. So we're actually gonna turn off a couple of things. Let's get rid of the search bar. Let's get rid of these actions on here. So we're just gonna see the search results. We can even call this results, something like this, right? Um, and there we go. All right, let's, let's do another one on the fly here. Uh, we, our original was cat in the hat, right? And we hit search. You should now get cat in the hat books. But there we go. So now we have the cat in the hat. We have actually the cat in the hat comes back. <laughs> we have different versions of cat in the hat in French, right? So this will allow our users to pick the book that's specific to the one that they're looking for, right? Um, or we can say like Dr. Seuss. So it can, doesn't have to be a title of a book. It can be an author of a book. All right, and if we want to allow our users to add this book to their library, all we need is a log table, right? So we can add a new table here. We can call this uh, library, and we'll just have the exact same columns. We'll have the title of the book, we'll have our author, and so forth. We'll also want the owner, and we can use their email address, so that way we can put on row owners. And then maybe the timestamp when they ordered or submitted the book. All right. And the last thing we need here is just a button to add it to our library. So I'm gonna add in the action section here, a collection item action that will say add to library. And this will be a new action. We're gonna do a couple of things. The first thing here will be an add row. And we're gonna to add to our library just the items that we parsed out. The owner will be our signed in user and the timestamp will be the current date and time. Okay, then after they've added to the library, we should show a notification. So that book added. Next, we can clear our result, so that way we can start from scratch. So we get, that's gonna be a set column action. Now, in order to clear our search results, right now we're in the context of our search results table, which doesn't have any columns to clear. We wanna clear the search table. So we need a reference from the results table back to the search table. Here's the trick on that. I've created a video on this as well. It's called Mastering the Single Value Whole Row. Uh, that's what we're gonna do here. So we're gonna create a single value column. And when you create a single value column to an entire row, which is what the search table is, it actually generates a relation. So I can actually call this relation to the search table, let's say. And the type here is gonna be not a relation, but a single value column. And the single value is gonna get the first, which is the only value inside of this search table here. And we're gonna grab the whole row. And again, you can see that this actually forms a relation to that table. And now that we have a relation to the table inside of our action here, we can actually clear through that relation. And so we're gonna clear both the search and the response, like so. Okay. Let's hit close and let's try this out. I'm gonna add this Dr. Seuss book of colors to my library and it should clear my search and also clear the results. All right, so our results have been cleared, but the inline list or the collection is still there. So we wanna hide that, don't we? So I'm gonna hide the collection when the response is empty. So if there's no response, sorry, it's not empty. So um, if the response is empty, then we don't wanna show it. All right, so let's search for a new book. Don Quixote de la Mancha by Miguel Cervantes. Search. All right, let me see here. There's a couple with images, some without images. So I'll pick the one with an image so that way it's pretty in my library and it should clear my search and my book has been added to my library. So if we were to finish up this app very quickly here, we can just add a final tab here of the library itself, right? And this looks 
fine, right? Except I don't want to allow them to add any books from here. Okay. And we could obviously make our tabs look prettier here too. And then maybe the very last thing here is that when they add something to their library, it actually takes them to the library, right? So let's go search for one more book um, about essentialism by Greg McCune. There we go. And so on this collection action here, let's name it or add book. Um, we can also then navigate, go to tab, and actually go to the library once they've added it. All right, here we go. Add a library, boom, take into our library, and there's our book. So yes, in this example, I am using books as our database, but just pick whatever database that applies to you and your profession or whatever the purpose of this app is. Maybe you're querying people data, maybe you're querying inventory data, right? And then you can get data from that existing database without having to uh, waste rows in your Glide app of storing obsolete data, right? The data from this API is most likely going to be up to date by the moment I'm searching for it. So we get this data on the fly and I can see that I get the a limitless amount of data into my app using only a handful of rows. Hopefully now you can see the power of this combination of the call API action along with the query JSON column in order to superpower your app. And if you have any questions at all about how I did any of the things that you saw here in this video, feel free to leave me a comment below. You can also reach out to me at Twitter at Arpetito. And as always, thanks for watching.